Okay, welcome to the <clears throat> second video in the AI art and modeling series. So this is officially uh, part one. The first, the first one covered uh, earlier is part zero. And sure enough, these are examples of AI art that I've produced using different tools. Uh, this one was produced calling, called, uh, using a, a model called Diffusion at 512 by 512 pixels. So we begin with a kind of notable, uh, if not infamous or famous situation where uh, three French students who, whose organization is uh, called Obvious, uh, which I've linked here, they produced an artwork uh, that was so-called created by an artificially intelligent program which at Christie's was sold for almost half a million dollars. And this was uh, about three years ago, uh, 28, October uh, 2018. So, I mean, this kickstarted a lot of discussion, clearly in the uh, business art world, um, as well as in the art world in general. And, uh, you know, if, you, if you're interested in this, you could look up Edmond de Bellamy, which is the title this is a portraiture, uh, presumably, of Edmond de Bellamy. And you can kind of look into this, this, this whole um, event, this news event, and come, come to your own conclusions. So I would say definitely, in, in my own experience, in terms of machine learning, it really matches this cartoon. Uh, you pour data in, if things don't look the way that you like them, you, you think they should be looking, stir the pile until they start looking right. Uh, I would say the machine learning art world is still operates like this because you don't know, when you turn a knob, when you change a value and you run an ML art program, you don't exactly know clearly what the parameters, these hyperparameter settings are going to do. Sometimes you do, sometimes you have a broad answer but you, but you don't know the specifics. Uh, you know, if you change the number from two to three, wh what's it going to do? You may know kind of on a macro scale what happens. And so, yeah, I think the cartoon to some extent is emblematic, em emblematic of, this, uh, of this field. So this is kind of a journey that originally this was uh, slide deck number one, it isn't. And so the only thing I'm going to focus on on this slide is just say, you know, this talk does not really cover a critique of either AI, machine learning, um, and the connection between technology and humanity. Uh, all of this is really a, uh, a, a great subject of conversation, debate, and indeed of scholarly writing. Uh, but but this these talks are not really going to cover that. So it's not that it is important. It is important to have this these discussions. It's central. Um, but these talks are more about method. Like if you want to get into AI art, here's what you can expect, and here are some of the issues. So one of my fascinations early um, before I went to college was a series of artists, and one was Thomas Gainsborough. And around 1740, 1750, he produced this painting of Mr. and Mrs. Andrews. And I just sort of fell in love with it. It was like, well, I like, I like everything about it. You know, I, I imagined, my imagination went wild, right? Imagine, you know, what if I could go back a couple centuries and talk with these people? What if I could walk the fields that uh, are present and surely probably they owned uh, in 1750, well, what would life be like then? Because this provides a sort of uh, potential for thinking about that kind of stuff. So anyway, I did a bunch of ML experience on Thomas Gainsborough, and I think my message to you is this. If you have an artist that you like, uh, or a designer, start with that designer, start with that artist, and then play around with ML art based on something that you already love and something you already appreciate and enjoy. For me, it happened to be this painting. 
So one of the first AI art packages to come around was uh, Google's Deep Dream. And you can see kind of the results here. Now, Deep Dream is available through Colab Notebook. It's available, I think if you say, there's a Deep Dream generator that if you Google that, you'll, you'll find stuff. And it looks pretty bizarre, right? I mean, it looks like a bunch of animal faces meant are placed in areas that are consistent with the original painting. So anyway, there are some hyperparameters, hyperparameter knobs you can twist and turn uh, on this kind of thing. Uh, something that is more recent, as of summer 2021, is a, uh, a non-style GAN modeling type called diffusion. And this is based on, on work that has been around, just like style, just like style GAN in, inherits from the original GAN paper. Um, same thing with diffusion. I mean, diffusion has been around, certainly within physics, it's been, it's central to the study of, of heat, for example. Um, in terms of images, people have been working on this for years, but uh, this is actually Catherine Krausen's notebook that produced this. And what's kind of weird is it produced it from this image. It's like you look at this image and you look at this and, you know, I sort of shook my head and went, what the heck is going on here? This is really cool. I mean, I think it's cool. And it, it's something that I think, you know, captures the imagination and has a color palette, which you'll hear about in painting, not unlike this. A lot of the uh, 18th century painters, a lot of paint, painters for about two or 300 years use what's called a dull palette. And the dull palette is in contrast to say the palettes that some of the expressionists, some of the impressionists used in the latter part of the 19th century. They used very uh, deep, rich, bright colors, which you're just not gonna see in this, in this kind of our artwork. So anyway, yeah, this kind of got me all infatuated and I wanted more. I wanted to see what else it could produce. Uh, you may ask, well, why, are, why aren't Mr. and Mrs. Andrews there? Well, maybe they are there, but you know, they're rocks and, and pieces of a hill. You know, that's what I found with, with some of the AI art. Um, this is based on um, some studies I did with John Constable, who was a, kind of an, another a generation younger than uh, Gainsborough. So I produced this and enjoyed it. It's a great landscape. Uh, John Constable did not paint it. Um, I think the key point of this slide though is to this word fake or remix. Now I like remix. I think remix culture is an integral culture within the art scene. It's something that is done both for uh, text as well as uh, imagery and video and music, especially. Uh, fake is a more sort of pejorative term, right? But it's something you need to be aware of. So people who are doing negative things, things that are either unethical or perhaps illegal, uh, will you will see in the news where it, the, the word fake will be applied. But having said that, that there are criminals out there and unethical people that will take advantage of it. Uh, there's still a lot of, that's true of any technology really. And there's, there's a huge amount of creative artists and designers that are doing really cool things. And um, yeah, I mean, you could say, well, it's a fake, but uh, I like, I guess I prefer to say it's a remix or it's just creative production um, without sort of stepping over the line. Uh, this is an original by John Constable. And in fact, I think this was actually created from this. This was used in an, as an initial image for one of the AI art programs that I ran. And uh, this is Wevenhoe Park in Essex, painted around 1816. So what's really going on with some of this diffusion? I you said I using a diffusion notebook. Well, there's a prompt that I put in there. I said, detailed landscape painting in the style of John Constable, rendered in Unreal Engine. Uh, going back to the first video where I mentioned the holodeck, this is kind of the kind of thing you might 
say in the holodeck, I want a detailed landscape painting in the style of John Constable. Um, the rendered in Unreal Engine is a, is part of the art of prompting. And there are folks that say that if you use something like that, you'll get a clear uh, image at the end, you know, something that's a little bit more detailed, uh, which is why I used it. I just wanted to see what it would do. There are many other hyperparameters for clip guided diffusion. And of course, there's a weave and hoe image that I showed you right here. So those things go into the big box, um, which is the neural network. And in this particular case, it's a trained, it's a pre-trained neural network and out comes the, uh, the image. So getting back to fake, um, there's many ways of thinking about fake and it's, it's a good thing to talk about, you know, uh, critically. Um, but you have to ask yourselves with, with, with fake, I mean, is something, are they all fakes? It kind of depends on how you define fake. I mean, maybe your eyeglasses produce fake uh, video, I mean, fake imagery, right? Because you need this technology, eyeglasses, in order to see the world differently. So maybe you're looking at a fake world all the time if you wear eyeglasses or contact lenses. The camera is a perfect example. It, it produces um, a snapshot with many hyperparameters like lens length and f-stop and all that kind of thing. And uh, the camera certainly, you could say, is all producing fakes. Same thing with binoculars, a microscope, or other technology that is used in imaging. And yeah, you know, maybe we all agree, maybe we'll come to agreement everything is fake, uh, which is certainly one possibility. So a couple of websites, there's a few websites that say this object does not exist. And this is a website, I, I have links to everything. So assuming these guys are still in business, uh, this website should, should generate new shoes that don't exist. And there's even one for cats. This cat does not exist for the, all of you uh, cat lovers. And this is from NVIDIA's research and, and work and code and represents um, somebody that doesn't exist. There's just a photograph as it were, but it's there, there is no person that looks exactly like this. There's people that may look close, close to this. And there's an area within AI art called projection which allows you to explore that kind of thing, you know? Um, and, and, and indeed image search through Google or other tools. Now, how can you tell by looking at it that the person doesn't exist and could have been created synthetically? Uh, one of the things are the earrings. The earrings look a little bit different. They're the, it looks like we have some lighting off the earrings. The earrings are probably metallic, which gives a strong speculative reflection but the, the lights look different here than here. And yeah, you also, you can't see any ear right here. I mean, you see part of her ear over here and uh, you know, that kind of looks reasonable, right? But over here, she's tilted in one angle. So perhaps that's why I don't see the ear. I guess I was expecting to see some, some ear, but um, the real giveaway with this is in the specular reflections on the uh, eyes. You'll notice that you see a couple of dots here where you see two dots that are uh, right next to each other right here on this eye. So that indicates, I mean, when you look at something, if you look at somebody's eyes when they are pointed towards something that may have lights or, or reflections, uh, those images, those light images should be very similar because the eyes are converging on, on the same thing. And so there's a link down here on eye light reflections and how these can be just one of many indicators to determine whether an image is, um, is real or not, or synthetically generated. This is a really good uh, overview of a lot of the work that NVIDIA has done, including their latest incarnation called StyleGAN3. So I highly recommend this, uh, watching this video. I think it's about 10 minutes, but it's definitely worthwhile.